I just want to begin by saying that obviously, um, I don't even know what week we're on here in the U.S. quarantine-wise, but um, you know we're all sitting in or proximate to some very real heartache and loss right now. To say nothing of disorientation. I mean, every day I still feel the hovering buzz of where am I? What day is it? What should constitute my sense of purpose beyond those I can serve right around me? Um, beyond the craft that I'm still lucky enough to get to do day in and day out. And, um, you know, kind of how do I channel these things, my capacities, in the wake of kind of widespread grief and fear. Um, and I really don't know what's going to happen on the other side of this or how to make sense of it historically, but I do think there's probably a worldwide consensus that this corona pandemic is a biggie, um, even if we don't reach, even if we do return to some sort of familiar way of life on the other side. So, you know, none of us really know how the world is going to look and feel different, and I don't think any of us here really want to rush that process. But the nature of some of the major questions felt ever more acutely as the days pass, questions of meaning and what's most important, questions of how we order our lives together, um, very big questions and concrete questions really of sort of justice and equity, trust and how we live in time, like Kronos time, um, the moral options that are before us now, as well as the moral arc afterwards, and I think especially sort of the levels at which interdependence are coming more to the fore at the household level, at the community level, somewhat national level, even international level. These are all being sort of kicked up as crises of this region scope tend to reveal who we are as people, um, and more often than not, sort of reveal our society's vulnerabilities. And amongst people of faith, specifically Christian faith, but kind of across the theological and ecclesial spectrum, I'm hearing a lot of statements that essentially swirl around this, this the following conviction, and this is, I'm summarizing what I've been hearing, but it basically is something like this. This pandemic has exposed a lot of brokenness, racial and economic inequalities, institutional weaknesses and dysfunction. It's incurred widespread fear and panic that we're not in control. Um, the way in which we in the developed West thought we were. Christianity seems to have been born for such a time as this. This is like this amazing moment for people of faith to accompany people in pastoral comfort and also to lead. So I kind of have heard that in a variety of ways for the last two and a half months. And I don't disagree, but I probably love to hear it expressed with a little bit more humility and a prayer, less sort of a breathless spiritual excitement that just because people are suffering and asking moral questions with renewed rawness, that now is suddenly kind of the faithful's moment to shine. Um, but it does seem like there is something in the water that begs for um, a sort of theological leadership or in, in a deep posture of service, both morally and intellectually. Um, culturally and even perhaps institutionally, but so far there just have been very few stabs at sort of the specific articulation of what this leadership could offer and how it could be characterized. So I say that as just a runway um, in advance of this conversation to kind of kick off the first question to, to announce here that um, Plow, as Pete said, and my own Comet Magazine and another wonderful organization called the Davenant Institute, we just thought it might be worthwhile to create an intentional space to allow this still vague conviction to be explored with more rigor and concreteness to sort of invite various kinds of expertise and perspectives from across the ecumenical spectrum to be channeled in a focused and more public way towards the questions kicked up by this pandemic and to sort of showcase a living dialogue that inspires and equips people of faith ideally to live out their identities as resident aliens. Um, the book title, that one of the many book titles um, of Dr. Harowitz's that Pete mentioned, just our identity as resident aliens in this time with creativity and courage. And also sort of try to show um, the broader watching world, what the sacred sector and all of its diversity is thinking and envisioning in this hour, if we are indeed thinking and envisioning anything. Um, so we'd really like to provide a space for, um, you know, Christian thinkers and doers to develop a clear, gracious and intelligent public voice to engage this moment in all of its slippery unknowns, including frankly, engaging honestly with the church's own flaws and weaknesses. So this rethinking and reimagining space, um, which for the next year will take the form of a website, uh, ideally it will launch into things incarnate on the other side, but we're, we're as Pete mentioned, it's called um, 
uh, breaking ground for a world renewed and you can check out we just soft launched this week um, and the, it's a, just a landing page at this point, but you'll get a little hint of where we may be headed um, at breakingground.us and feel free to toggle over there in the coming days. And if you're interested in getting involved or helping inform and guiding the questions we'll be pursuing, please get in touch with either plow or comment. Um, we expect to launch fully in early June. So that brings me to this conversation and my kickoff question, which I am going to address first to you. Dr. Harawas, and that is that sort of recognizing that, you know, we, I think at least in, in the US are at a very um, funky moment in some ways in that at one level, you know, we seem to be on the downward slope of at least the first wave of infections and deaths um, with many moving on past the just sort of acute questions of survival to questions of meaning making and kind of the normative shoulds of where do we go from here. Um, so I wanted to ask you how, like, frankly, even in light of this breaking ground initiative I just described that Plow and I are working on, um, how do you view this appetite for meaning making? Is it just sort of like a natural human thing that we should satisfy or is, are we kind of premature in our desperation to come up with something satisfying and productive? Are there dangers in pursuing sort of the narrative work too early or even at all? Um, my first response is a phrase like meaning making, I take to be a bourgeois mm -hmm. phrase that um, describes people who have too much time on their hands. Um, if you're struggling for um, existence, uh, you've got all the meaning you need. Um, I think um, one of the challenges of the situation we're in is um, we really don't know what the situation we're in is how to describe it. And that I remember when um, September the 11th uh, um, occurred, people said, you know, this means a re-narration of the world in which we find ourselves. And I said, no, um, the narration doesn't begin in September the 11th. It began in 33 AD. Mm -hmm. Now, how, how to reclaim the Christological narrative in a way that helps us know how to go on when we don't know what's going on, I think is part of the challenge before us. And that um, has to do with um, a reclaiming of the church um, as a community that's gonna make you distinctly odd. Mm -hmm. And because the stories that shape your life are not the stories that shape the lives of so many uh, in the world in which we find ourselves today. Mm -hmm. And that that means that uh, uh, Christians are going to have to uh, recover um, the sense that um, to be a Christian doesn't mean it's going to make your world safe. Mm -hmm. and um, how to recover that sense of danger. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, that was there before the virus and um, what it means to be a people that need one another because it's dangerous is, I think, part of what is the possible discovery that we now have before us. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, has it been your experience that in a funny way, it is actually um, Christians, to use that word loosely, um, that have sometimes been too quick to jump the gun, to, to jump to wanting to over-prognosticate? Yes. I mean, you, you want to over-prognosticate because we want to show we're in control of the world. Mm -hmm. That was the kind of Constantinian Christianity that I think um, is no longer a reality, though Christians 
haven't discovered that it's no longer a reality. Yeah, yeah. What do you think might, and this is sort of for all of you, what do you think might um, help revive kind of the virtue of patience that you're gesturing towards? Um, Especially for, I think, especially in the American context, which is not exactly known culturally as a patient, <laughs> a patient people. Well, I say before I die, which isn't that far away, I would like every Christian in America to know that they've got a problem with war. <laughs> now, that's, um, I mean, they don't have to be a pacifist. I'd like them to be a pacifist. Uh, but I just want them to know that to be a follower of Christ crucified Messiah means you've got a problem with war. Now that's mm -hmm. going to take a lot of patience <laughs> uh, because it puts you in a different framework uh, mm -hmm. than most of the people that surround you because to be for peace um, requires um, a patient um, embodiment of the ref I mean You've got to be patient because you can't kill your enemy. <laughs> and you've got enemies. And that's, uh, uh, that's very long suffering. Ed, was your Phil, do you have anything to respond there? Um, well, thank you for, for having me, uh, first of all. Uh, I wanted to you know, go, I think, back to part of your introduction in terms of this idea of, of, of suffering as being somewhat new. Um, I think because, you know, for some of us that the, the state of crisis is nonstop. Um, it's, it's unrelenting and, um, and what, you know, and, and this notion that, you know, some of us are sacred, some of us, I can, I think that we are all um, in some way, in some way sacred. And um, so this, it's not surprising that this moment is hitting um, some communities um, harder. Uh, but I think one of the ways that um, might be interesting to, to see emerge out of this is a kind of um, community within communities of, of faith, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's especially uh, with Christianity and African-based religions, and in moments of crisis, easily, um, you know, systems of faith or religions that have helped, for example, pe people survive. Like they, they exist because they, they've, uh, they've practiced these faiths. Sometimes come in conflict, and and people who are uh, struck. We haven't seen this in, you know, in, in yet, and with this particular cycle of, of disease within in Africa or in Haiti, where I come from, yet. But often, um, what I almost see coming, and, and when we talk about Christianity and, and being struck, and is that people would say, "Oh, this, you know, this is God's punishment upon you." Mm -hmm. And so, for me, that's really one of the things that I'm almost afraid is coming, um, mm -hmm. as um, you know, before we you know, regeneration, before anything else, you often have this cycle where people who are poor, who are suffering, who are really have always been suffering. Suddenly, if they if they are now have this um, uh, the, yes this other obstacles, then it's it's you know then it's framed that way. I'm 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 afraid that you know I'm that's one of the things that I in this moment when this began, I was of, of course afraid of um, the vulnerability of of certain countries like mine, uh, where you know where I was born in Haiti, but also then this sort of the then the the stigmatization of like of people being blamed for what happens and and then right. God being brought into it. Right. right. Go ahead, Phil. You looked like you were going to say something. <sighs> yeah, I, I don't. Um, I don't know how helpful this will be, but I was really struck reading Dr. Howard Wass's um, interview with Peter um, that went up the other day, and also um, listening to you talk tonight about patience. Um, because I mean, obviously, you're you're right. I mean, patience is a theological virtue, and I 
I guess I, uh, this is, all this is, is me articulating one reason why it's, it, it's very hard to be patient um, for a lot of, uh, for a lot of people at this moment, uh, is that panicking about the amount of suffering that uh, is happening and is a, probably likely about to happen, uh, especially given the, the you know, omnis shambles of the way that the United States uh, has, has responded to COVID-19. Um, yeah, it, it, it feels, it feels like I, I don't know how, if everybody relates to this or not, but it feels like I should just be panicking uh, all the time because even if I am not personally uh, at risk of getting the virus yet, um, you know, uh, a lot of people I know in prison either have it or they're worried about having it or they're about to go crazy from, uh, from being in lockdown. Um, and, you know, then I start thinking about climate change and, and what that is going to mean and how many um, similar scenarios to this one we're going to be facing. And it, I, I find myself feeling like if I'm not panicking and freaking out and, and trying to figure out the most massive impactful response <laughs> uh, that I could possibly do, and I apologize for using the barbaric word impactful, uh, you know, I'm <laughs> that I'm uh, that it's a form of laziness. Like it's we in I guess in other words, what I'm saying is is that my my framework for figuring out how to respond Christianly to this to to the state of the world is is so off that I it is it's hard to even feel patience as a virtue. I think patience, I think patience has to be always um, tied with hope. Mm -hmm. um, hope is a frightening virtue because it will pull you into a world that is unknown. And it can be um, extremely destructive if it's not schooled by patience. So patience can be another word for apathy if it's not schooled by hope. And hope can be another word for tyranny if it's not schooled by patience. And oftentimes we rarely become patient or hopeful by trying to be patient or hopeful. We find ourselves um, in communities that have us live lives of patience and hope, of which we then later uh, are able to name as patience and hope. I'm, I'm also, I'm, I'm interested though in how we balance, especially in, in a moment of crisis where really like there lines now to, you know, in, in, in this community, around this community where I live, where you have lines to pick up food that are miles long. And how do we uh, think about patience when it's so tied up with the urgency of now? You know, what Dr. King said, the urgency of now, I'd love to hear Dr. Revis talk about that, like how, how do we balance that patience when like some of us would say like, I don't have time for patience, like things are so urgent right now. You get the Marxist critique that patience is obviously uh, always um, a virtue that uh, those that don't need to be patient get to employ. Uh, and uh, therefore, it's kind of the opiate of the masses. Um, and that's the reason why it's so important for it to be in the context of the story of Christ in which you get, um, in which you get God's patience seen in the cross that gives you a way to go on that's not going to give in to those who um, 
act unjustly. Let's talk a, a little bit about um, interdependence and kind of what's being revealed right now about, um, you know, I'm, again, I'm going to kind of locate it here in the U.S. Um, sort of the, I think, specifically American myth of self-sufficiency, like what's being revealed about that right now. Um, Phil, you have this in your essay, which I just love and have now shared with multiple people the last 24 hours. Um, the medium is the message, not the Messiah. You begin it with these very powerful two sentences. You say, um, one of the cruelest paradoxes of our current media environment is this. He who cares loses. To care, after all, is to need. And while need can be filled, it cannot simply be watched. I just wanted to ask you if you think, even as you reflect on your own life now, and you know, if you think this pandemic is sort of resensitizing us to, to our own need for others, or is it tempting us in the opposite direction to kind of curl in, inward and numbing us still further to sort of the, you know, the pain of our neighbors? Yeah. Especially yeah. given the way we have to, we've been told to negotiate it through yeah. physical distance. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and that's a great question. Um, I guess what I have, I mean, obviously the pandemic is, 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 doing, uh, is doing both of those things, but I guess I, I will say that I, I, I'm surprised that how much less um, I guess I feel like I am seeing a lot more uh, sensitivity to people's need for each other than I was really frankly expecting. Um, uh, I've, like the words mutual aid have suddenly become like, like that's a term that normal people know now. Whereas like, I feel like three months ago, that was a term that, you know, you heard if you hung out on uh, anarchist message boards a lot, or if you read a lot of Noam Chomsky, like uh, like I did at one point in my life. Um, but there are mutual aid groups and and uh, you know uh, spreadsheets that are constantly like coming across my inbox. Um, I. I made, uh, I don't know how, how many uh, of my fellow panelists or, or people in the audience are aware of the social net networking site Nextdoor, which is, it's like the social network where you supposedly connect with people that are your neighbors. And I had never created an account there. One, because I don't need another thing to check. Two, because all I had ever heard about this site is that it was full of like terribly, like, racist suburban people call, um, freaking out about the presence of a black person on their block and say, I'm going to call the cops. And I just, this sounded like a demonic toxic space that I didn't want to be on. And I, um, I created a, a, an account uh, so that I could participate in mutual aid efforts a month ago. And I've just, I've been shocked at how normal and reasonable and commonsensical people are being. Um, even the fact that um, I keep seeing statistics to the effect that the percentage of people who uh, who are in the kind of like, let's, let's end lockdown uh, now and, and have a lot of working class people uh, die so that I can go back to Applebee's, um, th that caucus, that's about 25% of people. Frankly, that shocks me uh, that it's that low. This is this is a country that elected uh, Donald Trump president. Uh, I did not think that we were that in contact with reality. Uh, that only twenty five percent of people uh, are are uh, are against the lockdowns, um, and around seventy five percent of people uh, are willing to to subject themselves to the kind of shared misery of, of lockdown, which even for people in very fortunate circumstances, I mean, this sucks. Nobody, nobody likes this. Uh, I'm hyper introverted uh, and, you know, have, have went into the lockdown period, uh, you know, frankly, very exhausted from uh, just various meetings and, and various volunteering things I've been doing. And, and I, I hated it from day two. But people are willing to collectively take this on because they they don't want 
the aged and uh, they don't they don't want older people or immunocompromised people or or grocery store workers to to die and and quite you know uh quite frankly, I, I, I feel like I'm seeing more, uh, I don't know, glimmers of hope in the culture than, than I expected to see, which may just speak to my, my own pessimism, but <laughs> it's nice to see. You had started with a low bar. <laughs> I, I really did. And that's a good, sometimes that's a good practice because, uh, you know, you're not as, as likely to be disappointed. Um, so we're somewhat related to that, um, Edward, you've written evocatively in different ways, um, sort of about the pairing of the true realization of community in all the richness and complexity of that, what we mean by that, um, and sort of an honest felt assessment of need, a little bit for what sort of Phil was saying. Um, and, you know, I, I've a lot of what I've done, just my own little writing has been, I'm just like really fascinated by the whoop and morph of, of community life, when it's healthy, how, how are communities resilient after major disasters. And, um, you know, you, I think we all have seen this, especially in the last number of years of sort of increasing levels of natural disasters, especially, so I'm talking kind of about citywide or regional ride things, that you see sort of the social fabric emerge often in really beautiful ways and you're, you're sort of your hope in humanity returns and so on. And so it's, um, I'm just sort of curious how you would talk about um, this question of sort of like, is, do, do communities at their best actually, are they invariably born out of times of crisis? Um, or maybe that's only true in modern times. I'm just curious if you can talk about this yin and yang between the richness of our webs of connection and how we sustain those and very real pain which often necessitates our own or encourages our own willingness to live in a state of interdependence well i think uh as i as i said there there are communities where the crisis is ongoing, ongoing right? right and then the community um may not have uh, outside resources to count on. So they they turn to each other and that's that's the way that the community has survived. Uh, for example, in, in, in Haitian Vodou, there's a the, the notion of a laku, which is uh, an interdependence like from the time you're born, you're born into this community. And because, you know, you can't, you can't call 911 or because you're not, you know, there's, there's nobody outside, you, you kind of form a community which then supports each other. So out of that, it's, especially in rural areas, comes this uh, idea called the combit. And the combit is, was born out of you know, an agricultural society where today you work my land, tomorrow I work yours. Because if we don't do that, that work is not going to be done. So those communities at, at the same time are among the poorest communities, but they have learned how to depend on one another. And I think out of, you know, in moments of crisis, you see people maybe replicate that. And sometimes a crisis is overwhelming. Um, mm -hmm. Like when you had the earthquake in Haiti uh, in 2010, and for example, what people didn't see is that Haitians were the first rescuers of one another because they, you know, they, because that's what they had. So I think um, like, you know, Phil is saying, whatever that l little bit of the structure that existed before, I think if it's supportive, we, you, you turn to it or you amplify it, and we see these things perhaps, you know, I'm seeing around me, you know, um, these things grow in the Catholic church down the street that always had daycare, that always had certain, you know, things for the community because they, sometimes people are undocumented, they didn't have other places to turn to. So they had formed these structures for them. So now we're amplifying these structures, right? And, and but um, in places where they don't, they don't exist at all, and that's, you know, you see greater, chasms and maybe new things are created quickly or we hope new things get created quickly and community gets reformed or or re revitalized yeah i'm i'm sort of i'm struck by um what you've said about um you know some communities have been are, are perpetually in crisis many communities are and so uh you know what i might say is is like a staccato moment of crisis right now at some cosmic global or national level is you know this is something at some level of sort of psychic reality many people are dealing with all the time and i you know among other things i think um one thing i'm 
uh, learning through this in the last few months is just really trying to look for, um, you know, the sort of the wisdom, the wisdom to lead all of us really resides in those communities uh, that have been, whether it's deeply marginalized, whether it's impoverished, who have dealt with sort of a level of long suffering that there's, there's, there are principles and there are just sort of um, chiseled wisdom within there to, to teach the rest of us, um, but often like very little margin to do so. So I, I guess, I don't know if there's a question here, but I'm sort of curious, um, you know, whether it's at the level of mouthpiece or whether it's the level of pulpit, I'm just curious, what are the ways in which um, sort of, you know, the riches that have been born out of, um, long-standing pain. Um, I, I do think that's where so many of us need to look and I'm just curious how we think about how some of those communities do, are able to step up and kind of be a lighthouse. Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly don't want to romanticize that, right? No, no, I, I think that I, comes from so much hard earned, you know, experience. Like I, for, for example, the other day I was watching on CNN, uh, Native American community that was, they had set up roadblocks to, uh, because they, they were saying basically, if we allow COVID-19 into this community, it'll wipe us out. And so they had, um, they had structures that they already had that they were now forming to wrap, you know, to wrap their arms around each other, let's say, to protect one another. So I think um, it's, it's important, one of the ways that also to learn from, from all communities is to not neglect them, I think, and in, in, in even what we would call ordinary times, mm -hmm. right? To, 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 to not just turn in the moments of crisis, but to not dismiss their experiences or to learn more about their experiences, even, um, even when we're not, you know, but this, I think, makes people feel like, oh, now we're in, you know, we're in the same boat, so to speak, right? Um, but also to, to be aware. I think it's important. It's one thing like I feel like I learned in a more amplified way to be aware of my neighbors at all times because for a lot of us, we're just finding out who our neighbors are um, mm -hmm. during this time. I, I really agree with that. And I also think that there's a, another side to the conversation where <clears throat> There was a long, there was a long period of time where I sort of told myself, well, as somebody who's had the privilege to go to graduate school and and um, you know wedge myself into the American middle class, you know, kind of just barely after having grown up working class, um, it is it is now my duty to uh, use the the privilege and an income and whatnot that I receive to. To, to help those less fortunate than me. And one of the things that happened when I really started to do that, and I tried to do it in, a, in the least like patronizing or, or condescending way that I possibly could, was that I realized that there are ways in which even if you're lucky, even if you're reasonably well off, I mean, we are not always we are not all always suffering equally from, but we are all always suffering on some level from the amount of social siloing uh, that takes place in the society, um, that, that there is a very, um, James Baldwin talks about this, that um, one of the most important anti-racist things that white people could, could do was to realize uh, that this, living with the unreality that we had created was was making us sick as well. It was just making us more comfortably sick <laughs> in some cases. Um, and I, I think that that's, that's going to be true in any, with any kind of oppression. Um, I, you know, I mentioned prison, I keep mentioning prison because it's the thing I have uh, the most experience. Uh, it's the group of people that I have the most experience working with, but um, when I started, when I had worked with prisoners for a, a few years, I started to realize just how insanely prosecutorial our society is in ways that go far beyond the courtroom and how that ends up affecting everybody 
So, I mean, you know, ultimately God did not intend, intend us to, any of us to live in this way. And, and I think uh, along with everything else we do, uh, we, we need to like, to be paying attention for the ways in, in which, you know, uh, like that's true. I, I think that um, one of the things that we're discovering is um, the deficient character of our life, our social lives with one another. My way of putting it in a kind of hackneyed way is modernity names the time in which people are created to believe they should have no story except the story they chose when they had no story. We call that freedom. And then the question is, is how do you get cooperation between people who share nothing but the fear of death? Mm -hmm. And what we see in spades in this current uh, uh, response to the um, virus is the unbelievable fear of death mm -hmm. that um, we now have in this society. And of course the problem is that the story that you should have no story except the story you chose when you had no story is a story you didn't choose. <laughs> and that's the reason why freedom has become fate. Uh, and then we try to see what social class has the means to secure our lives against death in a way that other people aren't protected from. It's a very, it's a very complex business. The, uh, the role of, quote, science as legitimating um, uh, ideology here. Science, well, we're going to follow what science tells us to do. It's like science isn't a normative procedure in itself. How to get at those kinds of questions with a kind of uh, truthfulness, uh, I think, is part of the great challenge we face. And, and it's crucial for the formation of community. Could you just flesh that out a little bit more, Dr. Hauerwas? Like, what is the connection between our denial of death and our sort of individualistic orientation? Well, I mean, my view is, is that Hobbes wrote the, um, uh, wrote the story on that. In so far as you want to create a world in which sovereign individuals have to come together in order to ensure one another that they won't kill one another to give their loyalty to the ultimate sovereign who they have to obey without um, without uh, question. I mean, the role, the role of authoritarian politics in, in all of this is something that needs to be named because mm -hmm. it's... Uh, it's not, uh, it's not without consequence. A lot of people um, are asking, you know, what, what am I to sacrifice in all this if I have to be inside four walls? Um, that may be lifting soon, but uh, I'm just curious if each of you could reflect on the notion of sacrifice. I don't get to go to church. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big sacrifice. Yeah. Well, I, 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 when I think of when I think of sacrifice, I think of so, so with such relativity, um, because I know what my you know. There's so many of my neighbors who. Um, are sacrificing so much. And as you said, and when we're beginning, I feel like we can 
some of us can still practice our, our, our work. And so I always think of, of what, like the, the greater sacrifices um, out there. Um, but I think, you know, I, I think to, um, I, I feel like this, rather than, for me, rather than focus on the sacrifice, I think of what this moment um, will eventually um, it has already called upon some of us to do, or will eventually come, you know, call on us to do, and I think it will um, be greater and greater, um, you know, levels of, of of what we're thinking of sacrifice. But I, I keep going back to um, what brought us all together at Plow, this, this Martin Luther King issue, um, and and what had drawn me to what I ended up writing about is the, his notion of dangerous unselfishness. Mm-hmm. Um, where he talks about where I think many of us, you know, in the in the immigration community, we talk about it as sort of like, what do you when you're confronted with ICE or something like that? Um, but this he talks through this notion with the the Good Samaritan story. Um, you know, if when we ask ourselves if we're doing something for others, especially in this moment where, you know, we're told that if you go out, you could be risking your health, and you. It's a, if we're faced with the, with this idea of making the sacrifice for others, even people we love who we may not be able to go into the hospital with, or we may be afraid to care for um, if they're very ill inside our home. So I think I'm thinking of like these, I feel like as though the sacrifices that lie ahead are gonna be greater than even like personally, um, is, I'm, I see happening now. Yeah, I, I mean, I, the, I think, the thing that I've kind of had to sacrifice, um, uh, I alluded to this earlier a, a little bit with, with my questions about, or my comments about patients, um, is the fantasy of, of being super effective, uh, mm-hmm. of, of, of finding a, a you know, a, the, the thing that I can do, which I, I think in some ways is, is, um, is gendered, uh, not that women, I mean, women are heroic constantly, but men ha- have a need to be able to see themselves as potentially heroic in a movie kind of way, um, just in order to have any like kind of basic self-esteem at all. And so, you know, uh, yeah, I, 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 I found myself um, feeling the way, uh, you know, uh, a person who, uh, why, who it's, it's like World War II and you're, uh, you're not a pacifist and you're a male of military age, but you're, you're 4F or something like that. That is how I feel when I read about what doctors are doing or when I read about the grocery store worker who, um, who went back to work in unsafe conditions and she told her mom, well, I just want to help people and ultimately uh, died of of COVID-19, a young African-American woman. Um, You know, I read that and I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to just sit here. Um, And like, honestly, the most helpful thing that I can do right now is, is sit here and, give away absolutely as much of my paycheck as I can afford to, um, do a very little bit of volunteering before which I scrub my hands thoroughly, bleach the doorknobs and, and learn to sew. I've been learning to sew masks, which just like talk about challenging your sense of masculinity. Um, like that's what I've been doing. Uh, and, and, um, yeah, getting, uh, yeah, getting over the de- the desire to like invent something cooler to be doing. I think we discover um, as part of this and uh, uh, substantive convictions we didn't know we had, and that's not to be discounted. I mean, the very fact that uh, we discover that physicians are obligated to be present to patients, even um, when that puts themselves in danger, has always been there. And physicians learn it uh, by on the floor. They may not be terribly articulate about it, but you see it in practice. And we must be the kind of community 
that can sustain people called into medicine to do that kind of work. I mean, that's, that's something worth being articulate about where we don't lose it. Thank you all. On that note, I think I'm to welcome the Q&A from the audience out there dispersed. You're, Peter, you're on mute, your uh, microphone. There you go. Okay, so this is Zoom. Um, so thank you for all, each of you on the panel for a very illuminating discussion. Thank you, Anne, for, for hosting this. And uh, the conversation will continue. Um, while we're doing this, just to remind our readers, don't forget if you poured yourself another drink, remember that uh, Lori's tip jar, this is a bit of a fundraiser for her. Um, so my first question uh, that I'd like to, this is combining a bunch of the questions that have come in. This crisis has confronted us as a society with the reality of, of death. Um, that's something that each of you have dealt with in your work. Stanley, you mentioned it earlier in, in the beginning of the panel and Edwidge, of course, you've written a book, The Art of Death. Um, how should the fear of death guide how we think about how to respond to the crisis? Um, in what way is this a healthy reminder of what it means to be a human being with a, with a finite life? This summer I'll be 80. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's not that far away. Um, I think it helps us understand that we should have deaths, hopefully, that are commensurate with lives being well lived. And therefore, um, there's a relationship between um, how we die and how we live that we seldom are very are we're not very articulate about. And uh, I hope that that's one of the things that we might start recovering in response to this endemic. Uh, even you know, having written a book about death and having read a lot about it, I feel like all I know about death, I, I learned at the bedside of my, both my parents as they were dying and um and they were not afraid and it's something that i think like i asked them often and part of that had to do uh, so much with what dr arrest was saying because when they look back they felt like they had lived a good life they had served um but what i felt like really made them unafraid was they they had a notion of continuity about their lives that they felt like mm -hmm death was so much a part of life that it was expected, it's, um, but, but that there was a continuity. They were, they were very, very uh, deeply religious. And, and so they, 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 my mother would always say, I know where I'm going. And um, so I think that notion of continuity about life, life to so death as just another, as, as a true transition, as just a, like a, a door to another room, I think it's Faulkner said. Um, so that that really for me was was profound. Yeah, I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I uh, the reason this question and this came in from a couple of our listeners uh, struck me. Um, one of my friends works in a local nursing home where they've been very hard hit here in Orange County, New York, and um, have had a lot of people passing and uh, so many of the the older folks that she worked with expressed something similar to, to what you you said Edward um, you know because we live in a society that 
does everything it can to postpone the idea that we're we're finite, that we're not going to be here forever, um, that has promised um, us that uh, everything uncomfortable can be postponed indefinitely, right? And there's uh, Elon Musk and other uh, billionaires uh, exploring uploading your mind and transhumanism and sort of artificial uh, immortality. And I think particularly, you know, Plow is published from we believe in the resurrection. We believe uh, in, in Jesus and that he, we will come again, that we will have that faith uh, that those who pass uh, will rise again. Um, I think here is a place where we perhaps have a, u a unique opportunity uh, as, as people who do believe um, to say something, but what is it? And, and how, how do we do that? Uh, Stanley, I, I know you and I talked a little bit about that in our conversation, um, part of which made it into into the regeneration issue. I um, I say that Americans think if we just get good enough at science-based medicine, we'll be able to get our life alive, <laughs> and. Um, and that, of course, is a, a, a false hope. And how, um, I, I mean, interestingly enough, if, if, we, if we didn't die, then life would just be one damn thing after another. Death creates an economy that makes certain things valuable and other things to be avoided. And how to display that for one another uh, is um, an ongoing challenge and we haven't been terribly good at it. Uh, the, um, that your parents were so wonderful. I mean, you're very lucky to have such parents. <laughs> Next question, um, I'll, I'll again throw this to, out to each of you. Uh, one of the themes that has come through in our conversation is we speak of a time of crisis now for the pandemic, but for so many, this crisis has always been there. It's actually revealed a crisis that has been there for probably most of, peop uh, of people on the planet and has only touched the comfortable uh, through this. Um, does this time of crisis give you hope that we society can change. Um, one uh, reader comments here, listener comments here, the rush to return to normal is frightening at a level because the consumerism, global economy and nationalism that existed have all been exposed. How do we hold compassion for those suffering with a desire to not return to normal, but rather to learn and transform? Yeah, my, uh, my first reaction to people saying we need to return to normal is, what in the hell is that? <laughs> did, did we have it before? I think, I hope not. Um, the very notion of normality um, is, not, uh, um, is not very helpful for helping us know how to uh, name the moral challenges for the kinds of communities we need to be in. I mean, and sadly too, I mean, the, the rush, you know, when in places where they've opened, the rush to immediately crowd a space or the, to, you know, it's, it's worrisome. I think, I think people will just, it, it's sad to see, I think most people will just go back to how they were living. And I think, um, ultimately, even in the discourse, that's what people are fighting for. They just like they want, like they want to forget that this ever happened. And I think the the unless you know the people who have lost loved ones, like many people I know, the people who are scarred by this moment forever, will carry a certain burden. But but I see the people who just want to forget this ever happened. I think that's uh, you know at, at the end of um, the, the the plague, where Camus talks about there's that moment between, just right between the celebrations and between the forgetting. Um, and I think a part of the returning to normal is people want to forget, they want to, they want to quickly move on, which would be sad if we didn't. Um, 
we learned and, and we have to relearn some things. We relearned them after hurricanes here, for example, to relearn that the reason this current moment is, is so hard on, you know, the, the suffering is, you know, on people who chronically suffer is that the normal was broken anyway. And, and let's go back to, you know, if we, if we go back to it, we're just exactly where we were before. I can only speak from my own experience, but I feel like when I look at the people I know, uh, the people who I am in communication with regularly, which, you know, is, is, a, is a group that, that does cross, you know, various social, social lines and class lines, um, I sense a real uh, unwillingness to, to, to return to normal um, and a, a feeling of, of either of, of, of being having been chastened uh, or uh, uh, of, of, of being reminded of, of, of certain things that I, I, th I think will be fairly hard to get rid of. When I look at the media, which I mean, that's a, that's a, a fairly, uh, large and not always helpful uh, noun, but uh, like when I watch television uh, and, or when I spend too much time on Twitter, that is when I, that is when I have the, the terrible feeling that, oh my God, we're going to go back to normal and what a, what a tragic waste that would be on, on top of uh, what is already a tragic waste. Um, so what I conclude from that, that disjunction is, is that it's, it's the job of, um, and this kind of gets at one of the questions uh, that uh, I know you, you wanted to ask earlier, um, Anne. Uh, it's, it's the job of people who write. Um, it's the job of artists. It's the job of people who preach to remind people of what they are immediately going to be pressured to, to forget. So uh, I guess I'll throw another question out there. Um, I guess this one is a little directed at you, Phil, but everyone, anyone else can weigh in too. Is individual action the best we can do right now? E.g. sewing. Yeah. I mean, it's the best I can do. That doesn't mean it's the best we can do. I don't, if I knew what the best thing we can do is, I'd be doing it. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know. I, f I feel like, I mean, th that feels like a very uh, specifically left-wing question, uh, uh, which is, I, I don't mean that snarkily. I'm, I'm, I'm a leftist. Um, but I feel like leftists always want to have uh, the argument about individual action versus uh, figuring out how you can uh, group, you know, get in a group with other people and, and alter structures. And I feel like, um, that becomes a trap, uh, like a discursive trap uh, that um, even in order to, um, even if I knew the thing that we should all be doing to change society uh, structurally or the group that we should all be joining up with in order to change society. And, you know, five months ago, I thought I did. And it was the, the, the presidential campaign of Bernard Sanders. And that just blew up in my face. Uh, you know, but even if I knew what that was, it still requires all these individual, uh, it, it still requires individual resolution and individual decisions to even become part of that collective solution that you think you found. So I, uh, at, at moments when uh, everyone is confused and everything is in disarray and nobody knows what the heck to do, I am a big believer in looking for the nearest good thing locally or in your, in your family and, and starting from there. That is, so no, sewing masks is not like what we should do, but it is, it is the next good thing that I know to do. And I, do believe in figuring out what that is for you and just doing it. Edwards, do you have anything to comment on, you know, based on to your, your work in the immigrant community there and, and also your, your homeland of Haiti? I think it's, it's just so important to start where we are because um, often, you know, there are people who, who are able to do 
the communal gathering and there are people who will write, there are people who will sew masks. And, um, and especially, I mean, one of the things that, for example, when this started, I really wanted my children to do some kind of service. And then I realized one of them is immunorepressed, you know, is on a drug, that's immune, and then, so we can't go out there. Um, and so how do we start where we are? And then it's like, okay, we'll join the check-in phone service that checks on elders, or we'll try to do what we can within this, this confinement. So sometimes the bigger, I mean, it's, it is definitely important to, to work in groups, but um, we, we each have, you know, we, we have to start where we are, I think. A question from one listener here. Uh, the early church nursed those dying of plague and small smallpox, and their witness, not the preaching, convinced folks that this gospel was hot stuff. Where and when did we lose that focus, and what can that teach us now? I didn't get that. Would you say it again? Uh, the early church nursed those with plague and oh. smallpox, and uh, what, where and when did we lose that focus, and what should it teach us now? Yeah, Basil the Great um, with the Cappadocians was going to build a new city, um, and um, uh, Gregory of Nazianzus said that he had to put in the middle of the city the hospital, which would take care of the lepers. Uh, that's way the city knew what it was about. Um, that, um, I mean, hospitals were where you went to die. Uh, uh, I think that that um, is a normative account of um, how Christians should live and care for the sick and the dying, uh, which means first and foremost that you don't abandon the sick and the dying. Um, that uh, the modern hospital was primarily um, the uh, um, production of Christian imagination is, so, is often forgotten. And uh, I think that uh, it's, again, a great uh, moral gesture that uh, we dare not lose in terms of its significance. I think that, that to tag on this a little bit out of my own of curiosity and, and just the way I've been thinking through mourning in this moment is that the way this pandemic and even the way the hospitals are structured, we hear so many stories about even like, el you know, we can't be with our sick and dying. We can't, people can't be with their sick and dying parents. Um, so that even, I feel like that even brings it into a family unit. Um, I am watching funerals of people who've known me since I was a little girl on Zoom. You know, you're watching those funerals on Facebook, all these rituals. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering if there is a substitute for that. And, you know, that idea that we can abandon our sick and dying, but the structure, the moment forces us because people are so afraid of being infected themselves. And even the hospital, you know, you hear stories of people who said, last time I saw my husband, I dropped him off at the door and he went in and then there are all these doctors who are also doing this transition work of keeping people on the phone. So in a way, these, these structures have broken even the possibility of mothers and daughters to be together, or family members to, to be with their dying. Yeah, I have a, a friend who's, uh, he's written for um, the prison uh, literary magazine that I run before um, and he's in a COVID isolation unit so he, he's young I'm hoping for him to pull through but like uh, there is 
there is a very real danger uh, that not only that that he dies alone or that he dies, uh, you know, attended by someone who whose job is to be antagonistic to him, um, and that's already been a, a the, that's an example of of the kind of like emergencies that were already going on that, that Edwidge uh, has, has alluded to before, because that's already the case with prison medical care. <laughs> Some people die uh, more or less alone uh, all the time, uh, totally unnecessarily. It's very common to refuse compassionate release, uh, even for uh, even for people who are, are no threat to society. Um, so I, 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 I guess I'm just saying that's another way in which this, uh, the situation we're in is revealing ways in which uh, we've, we've created a structure that militates against doing these kind of basic Christian duties. So um, one final, final question. We've talked about dangerous unselfishness. So Martin Luther King, Edward, you mentioned that. We've talked about patience and hope. We've talked about interdependence. Um, does this time of crisis give you hope that we can change, that it's possible for people to change? We've seen a massive shift in the way people live their everyday lives. Is there any hope we can gain from looking at this experience? What, what direction can you give us looking forward? Despair is a sin. So our hope is in the unrelenting grace of God to make us more than we thought we could be. So sure, I have hope. I have, oh, I'm sorry, Edwidge, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, uh, I, I have seen in the last two months, um, middle-class white-collar people speak of grocery store workers respectfully and that frankly is is so unlike my usual ex I, I live in in Ann Arbor it, this is a very snooty town um, that's a new ex that's a new experience for me since you know since since I, I like this became uh, my social surroundings. So quite frankly, like that's, that's unprecedented. That does give me a little bit of hope. Um, the, the degree of, of awareness that people have, uh, e even if that's a, a disquieting awareness that they're going to want to try to forget as soon as this is over, the degree of awareness that I am seeing, um, for how necessary, necessary workers are, um, is something new in, in, in my lifetime. Um, and, also, my uh, my father uh, has retired during this. The man was 75 years old. He was working a high risk job. Uh, he's a janitor, uh, which means you know he comes in contact with people. Uh, I went into this just dead certain, uh, like because this. I don't know if any of you have had this kind of situation with your parents. Uh, but this man would not retire. Like, we've been begging him for years. Um, I've tried to bri to bribe him out of it. Uh, he would not do it. Um, and my my father uh, has announced that he's not going back to work. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, you don't know my father, so that doesn't carry the weight with you that it does me. But like I'm telling you, that's a miracle. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I mean, there, there there are little things like that 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 have happened. That yeah, they do give me hope. Well, I think um, one of the things that keeps me from despairing um, is, for example, in, in the piece that you wrote, Phil, about with the book Roundup, I think it was in the McCormick book, where uh, you, you uh, say that she says that the tools to address our current crisis exist. And, and I think it's so important to look back in moments, you know, we're talking about Dr. King and, and, and others, in moments that uh, where people have uh, survive before, where they've where they've uh, overcome dark times, and uh, and and these tools they, that have been used, like joy, compassion, fellowship, and looking after the people who were most vulnerable among us, among us, and and I think also a people of faith or various faith to also acknowledge that you know we don't 
not, and none of us have a, a, a monopoly in compassion and that it's expressed differently in different, in different circles. And I, I so believe, I think, one of the things we've seen, you know, outside of faith communities is that people who are showing love, I mean, hopefully for love's sake, right? And that, and that because they're afraid they're going to hell if they don't do something, but because they see themselves in other people. And that's something that I wish that, that hope that carries past this moment into uh, the dailiness of, of, of all of our lives. Well, I can't think of a more perfect note to end uh, this discussion on. And, you know, that is, again, what Plow is about, is spurring on one another to these acts of love, these deeds of love, this practice of love. Um, we hope all of you who have been watching have benefited from this evening. I realized there was a hundred questions. I think I only asked five or six. Uh, so there is many more. Um, we'll have to do this again. We will do this again. Um, we'll be doing more events like this. But first, just thank you, Ann Snyder uh, from Comment Magazine for your moderating this evening. Thank you to each of the panelists, Edward, Stanley, Phil, for joining us tonight. Um, there will be future Zoom uh, events that we from Plow will be doing, sometimes with, with other folks. Um, first, uh, June 1st, we'll be launching this Breaking Ground for a World Renewed site that Ann told us about um, earlier, and we're very excited about that. So that's June 1st. Um, another thing that's related to this special issue of Plow that we'll be doing is actually a Zoom uh, play. Um, so that will be Eugene Vodolazkin. He's a Russian novelist, award-winning. Uh, he wrote a book, Laurus, one of my favorite novels. Um, he's written a play called Sister of the Four about the coronavirus. That will be a, a Zoom performance of that. It'll also be published as part of this issue. So look for that coming up. Um, we're about to turn to the ending of this. And so as you do so, and possibly like me, maybe go back to Lori Schwartz's video of how to make this plow recce thing and figure out how to do it and maybe do it. Uh, remember to uh, put something in the tip jar for KGB. And thank you, Lori, for joining us tonight too. And we look forward to seeing you in person. Please, uh, all of you watching, if you haven't already uh, subscribed, we're all nonprofit small magazines here. We really love subscribers and we do appreciate it when folks sign up. So get on the Plow site or Comment Magazine. Uh, go on the Breaking Ground site, which is just coming out there, and you can uh, put your name down in the little email field, and we'll update you on what's coming out from there. Well, I hope this evening was uh, beneficial for all of you. I really appreciated hearing this conversation. And, you know, as a final, final word, I, I'd like to just read um, one note uh, from, I actually put this in the editorial where I introduced this regeneration issue, and uh, I think it's appropriate. It's from John Donne, the poet, God hath made no decree to dis distinguish the seasons of his mercies. He can bring thy summer out of winter, though thou have no spring, though in the ways of fortune or understanding or conscience thou have been benighted till now, wintered and frozen, clouded and eclipsed, damped and benumbed, smothered and stupefied till now. Now God comes to thee, not as in the dawning of the day, not as in the bud of the spring, but as the sun at noon to illustrate all shadows, as the sheaves in harvest to fill all penuries, all occasions of invite his mercies, and all times are his seasons. So this time I feel is his season two. And as we heard from Edwidge, from Stanley, from Phil, it's, it's our job to use it, and uh, may we all do that. So thank you for joining us this evening, and uh, we look forward to the next time. So good night and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. This was an honor. Night.